Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. In the 60s, numerous American GIs reported encountering five to six foot tall ape-like creatures out in the jungles of Vietnam. These creatures were covered in hair, walked upright on two legs like a human, showed little to no fear of the men, liked to throw rocks, hundreds of these encounters with these things, some resulting in bloodshed, would come out of the war on both sides. So many stories of this creature, in fact, that following the war, investigations were launched by the Vietnamese to capture or kill one of these things. Nothing more than human-like footprints were ever recovered, though far too long and wide to be that of a human being. These things were elusive and obviously intelligent. The locals called it the Batutut. American soldiers called them rock apes. Skeptics called them hallucinations brought on by the use of marijuana. Then LSD. Then broken minds of scared, stressed men in a war-torn zone. They had to call it something, though, because there was no denying these soldiers' stories. So consistent in description and too prevalent to chalk up to someone's attempt at a hoax or tall tale. Last season, I covered UFOs and extraterrestrials. It's a hard sell to skeptics to this day. But I found it rather compelling when I came upon story after story from government officials, military pilots and generals, commercial pilots, police officers who claimed to have seen a UFO. It gives it a certain level of credibility and reliability. So, in today's episode, we'll be placing the same lens of legitimacy on the Sasquatch phenomenon. We are going to go through the stories quickly, as quickly as I can, as I did decide to include many in just this one episode, because I like to impress upon you just how prevalent experiences with Sasquatch can be with people working in a professional, official capacity. It's not always going to be Joe Schmo out in the backwoods of Kentucky. Sometimes it's someone with a clearance and has a a hard-earned professional reputation to lose by coming forward. Because we are going to move quickly, I encourage you to check out today's sources for more details to each story. With that, let's begin. Fort Lewis, located in Pierce County, Washington, has a long history of possible Bigfoot activity. In 1971, a 19-year-old patrolman was walking the perimeter of his barracks area. Between barracks sat an open field that stretched about a hundred yards wide and ended in a tree line of a forest. As he continued patrolling, he noticed a dark silhouette walking from the trees and toward him through the field. It was after midnight, but with a full moon, clear sky, and a backdrop of white snow, he made out a description as this figure moved towards him and then stopped, then moved towards him and stopped. The young man had to question what he was seeing because there wasn't supposed to be any personnel out at that time of night. He said it had a sway to its walk. Its shoulders were exceptionally broad or looked big on top. And what made it unusual was its overall huge size, being much taller and bulkier than a man. The patrolman was only going through basic training at the time and had not been issued a weapon and so carried a folding shovel instead. Feeling this wouldn't be a suitable weapon against something of this size and the creature's continual stop-and-start motion toward him, he was frightened enough to go back inside his barracks. He said he didn't tell anyone at the time because he was afraid he would be forced to go investigate whatever it was that was out there. Fort Lewis, 1984. Good year. A sergeant of the military police, along with a K-9 unit, were called to investigate some strange cries the duty officer heard coming from the tree line. They split up to better sweep the area and headed into the trees. He soon heard five distinct pistol shots coming from the direction the K-9 unit had taken, followed by a deep, guttural growl that built into a high-pitched howl. 
The sergeant continued forward to an agreed-upon meet-up point located at the edge of a large field. Maybe it was the same field as our previous story? Same forest? I don't know. Maybe. He met his captain there. However, the canine unit was nowhere to be found. Unbeknownst to the sergeant, the canine unit's canine had taken off through the trees, and they had given chase. As the sergeant stood on the field's edge, he noticed a large dark shape moving along the tree line on the other side of the field. Thinking it was a bear, he just watched and waited. Then the shape turned out of the trees, making its way toward them. The sergeant said it didn't register immediately, but something wasn't right about this bear. It was clearly walking on two legs. The figure continued on its path across the field when it suddenly stopped, shifted its body fully toward him, and stared. With the dawn approaching, he could make out features of what he was looking at. It was covered in short, dark hair, had massive shoulders and arms, stood seven and a half to eight feet tall, no neck was evident, and the face appeared to be ape-like, though he says he couldn't quite make out clear facial features. The sergeant says they stood in this frozen stare-off for two to three minutes before the figure walked away, looking back at him only once before disappearing into the trees on the opposite side of the field. He did not make an official report, though did receive some criticism and harassment from those he told privately. Shocker, right? Another out of Fort Lewis comes two years later, in 1986. A military police law enforcement command officer stationed at the base was driving toward his barracks in North Fort Lewis along with his friend and fellow MP right around dusk when they observed a large, fur-covered, upright-walking animal cross the two-lane road ahead of them. Its stride was long, and he says it made it across in just four steps. It had long arms with fingers coming to just above its knees, a large head with a prominent brow and sagittal crest, like a gorilla's, but larger. Its hair was shaggy, long, and matted like a mountain goat's. It walked with a slight stoop and stood about eight feet tall. Somehow after seeing this, the officer got excited, thinking it to be a bear, and he was excited to see his first in the wild. The cognitive dissonance was strong in this one. The animal had stopped at the edge of the trees and was turned and looking at them as they pulled over to get a better look. At this closer range, the realization quickly set in, not a bear. <laughs> How many times have I said that during this season? How many times am I going to have to say that? You see, people want to be logical right out the gate, even when it doesn't make any sense. So, anyway, this non-bear then takes one step into the trees and disappears. The two MPs got out of their truck, shocked. They could hear its footsteps as it moved deeper in until they suddenly stopped. At that point, they started making their way into the trees to follow where they last heard it. About 30 yards in, they heard the crack of a large tree limb followed by a scream just ahead of them. They both started booking it. Back to the truck. The officer that tells the story says the animal chased behind them and continued screaming. They would go back the following day, though the ground wasn't conducive to retaining any footprints, they did find several tree limbs bent and broken, high enough up it had to have been done by something very tall. Though they were laughed at by friends that they had told following the encounter, they would learn years later that these friends, too, had actually seen something similar during their own evening patrols. The officer states he was a non-believer in Sasquatch until his experience. Now, Fort Lewis is no longer just Fort Lewis. In 2010, it linked up with its neighboring McCord Air Force Base, and the entire venture is now called Joint Base Lewis-McCord. But there have been plenty of sightings and reports from the McCord end as well and in the surrounding areas and towns near Spanaway and DuPont. This is all located just south of Tacoma, Washington, which is a, a pretty busy little city. But I have driven 
the back roads in the area. I, I used to live in the area. I used to work in DuPont off of I-5, uh, go to friends' houses. I even camped out not too far away from there. I never saw anything, of course. Uh, and at the time, I did not realize what a hot spot the area was. But thinking back, even as close to Tacoma and like bustling civilization as it is, the forest is there. It is thick. I can absolutely see how an animal like Sasquatch could reside in this area. That's, it's not surprising at all. Next up, let's look at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Now you might think the Mojave Desert couldn't possibly offer up enough Sasquatch activity to even talk about here, but you better think again. Tales of the desert-adapted Sasquatch go back a very long time in the area. Natives who inhabited the Antelope Valley and greater Mojave Desert of Southern California for thousands of years told tales of hairy devils who resided there. Airmen of Edwards Air Force Base call the creature Blue Eyes, though it has been referred to by many names across the region, Mojave Sasquatch, Sierra Highway Devil, Marvin of the Mojave, and the Yucca Man. In 1974, Sergeant Michael House was on night patrol in his truck outside of Mars Station near an abandoned sled track heading back to the main base. Suddenly, he noticed 200 to 300 yards to his left, large, glowing blue eyes, four inches apart and seven feet from the ground. He stopped his vehicle and watched as the eyes proceeded toward him before stopping about 100 yards away. He said it was too dark to see any sort of form or body shape, but his hair bristled as the eyes began to circle as they moved closer toward him. They stopped once again, this time at about 50 yards away. He described a rotting smell permeating the air. Right then, he was advised over the radio to proceed back to the main base, and he took the opportunity to quickly do so. He would later describe that the eyes moved very quickly without bobbing up and down, as you would expect with a walking or running human. Sergeant House would actually make an official report on the incident, which was met with exactly the reaction you think it would, which in turn would contribute to a standard of non-reporting from other patrols of uh, anomalous and strange occurrences witnessed while on duty at the base. In the winter of that same year, Air Police Sergeant Barton would be patrolling on base in the vicinity of the Rocket Propulsion Lab when he saw some strange blue lights in the nearby mountains. Due to the high security of the area, he began driving toward them, assuming they were the headlights of trespassers. The lights vanished before he arrived, driving to where he had last seen them, and he realized in doing so, he had driven into soft desert sand and was now stuck. On his way back to the base, he encountered another patrol who radioed for a tow truck. He would return to his vehicle with the tow and would discover it surrounded by 14-inch long, three-toed footprints. Hmm. Weeks later, Sergeant Barton would be patrolling near the rocket site when he noticed movement across the skyline of a nearby hill. He couldn't see much detail but could tell whatever it was was girthy, describing it as immense. He called headquarters to urge his replacement to hurry up. As the sergeant looked back to the hill, he witnessed two large blue orbs, like eyes, moving toward him. He would describe them as moving on an easy glide, not bouncing the way a person would when walking. Suddenly, headlights appeared down the road. Barton would go to meet them, thinking they were his replacement. Come to find out, no, they were just responding to another report about some strange lights observed in the hills. Tracks would be found in the area following the sighting, with Sergeant Barton saying they looked similar to what he had seen weeks prior. And Barton would not make an official report. Our bodies come in different shapes and sizes, so doesn't it make sense that our weight loss plans should too? That's the beauty of Noom. They build a personal plan that factors in dietary restrictions, medical issues, and other personal needs so your plan works for you. Noom doesn't restrict or shame when you want to treat yourself. Their flexible program focuses on progress instead of perfection. You don't have to give up carbs or anything. 
And with their daily lessons, you can learn something new about your food choices every day. After just a few days of using the app, I learned how to recognize cues for overeating and how to choose the right foods to feel full. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M. Dot com and check out Noom's first ever cookbook, The Noom Kitchen, for a hundred healthy and delicious recipes to promote better living. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. Encounters with this blue eyes fella was such a regular occurrence that Edwards Air Force Base would officially acknowledge incidents with this and other strange phenomena that had taken place in an article in the base newsletter Inside Edwards. The article reported the entity known as Blue Eyes was a hot topic of discussion at a reunion of the 6510th Air Police Squadron officers who had worked on base from 73 to 79. Attendees traded memories of their bizarre experiences on patrol, such as seeing Blue Eyes, the local version of a Yeti near South Base, or Marvin of the Mojave, a ghost who could be heard but not seen and left size 10 sneaker imprints in the sand. Edwards Air Force Base is also rumored to have captured Old Blue Eyes, or the Yucca Man, on video many times around base, but also wandering inside of their secure underground tunnels, which house some of the U.S. military's most advanced and top-secret technology. But no big deal. (laughs) In the 60s and 70s, It is said police units would be sent down into the tunnels on wild goose chases to locate the creatures and even what appeared to be whole families of them who had managed to sneak in, but to no avail, as if they would just up and vanish. In 1997, Doug Trapp wrote an article including details of surveillance by three separate parties with personal involvement and knowledge of the ongoing monitoring of these animals on base. The first was a lieutenant who was alerted by his guard of an infiltration of the perimeter by a very tall man. But not really a man. When he arrived at the guard's location, he easily spied the figure in question through his scope and saw what he described as a very tall, hair-covered, ape-like man wandering around, appearing to look for something on the desert floor about 500 yards away. When he informed his superiors of the activity, he was told simply to keep it in sight. Soon after, a helicopter arrived in search, spooking the animal, which the lieutenant says ran like a deer around a rock pile and out of sight. The helicopter would search, but they would not find the animal. The following day, when the lieutenant reported to the command post of what he had seen, he was told that these animals had been seen on base before. They were what the public referred to as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. There was some concern that they might have been related to the unidentifiable craft they often spotted over the base. So he was told to simply continue observing and reporting his sightings, but never to intervene or disturb them until command had determined what they were. He reported to Doug over the following years he would observe the Sasquatches on base many times, that they had videotaped them many times, but that the tapes were classified and held under top security at all times. Doug would also speak to a major who was in charge of a command post at Edwards Air Force Base and had served there from 1970 to 1978. He would confirm what the lieutenant had told Mr. Trapp, but also... Uh, add that they had been seen in the secret underground tunnels beneath the base via surveillance cameras. A third contact that Doug spoke with used to work security at the base and said that he had seen the desert Sasquatches many times through his scope. He had seen a few that stood over 10 feet tall. He had seen females, young ones, and once a group of five of them, all between six to eight feet tall, walking together. He described them as fully hair-covered except the palms of their hands, the base of their feet, and their face. Their face resembled that of an ape with small eyes, a flat nose, and ape-like lips. The arms were long and slung down to the knees. They had feet like ours, and he had been able to track them through the desert many times. 
Though he himself had never been able to view the surveillance videos, this third contact would confirm that, yes, they did in fact exist. This contact would say he felt the creatures remained on the base because somehow they knew they would not be harmed, as if they could pick up on a feeling of danger and could feel that the airmen's general attitude towards these creatures was very much to not engage. Doug would end his article saying that several sources had told him, as of 97, that the desert Sasquatches were still being monitored at the base. Weird stuff going on over at Edwards Air Force Base. Lockheed Martin is like a hop, skip, and a jump away, as I recall. Just saying. Uh, numerous locals have over the years reported sightings of this desert Sasquatch stalking their homes, peeking in windows, crossing highways, stories aplenty around the area. Google it. Trust me, you will see. But I think it is extremely interesting that members of the military also are consistently seeing them within the boundaries of this highly secure zone. Hmm. Uh, the next one that I am going to talk about is one of the most excellent group encounters that I think I have come across. There were four military witnesses to this event, which took place at Bergstrom Air Force Base near Austin, Texas in 1981. The witness, who tells the story, had been stationed at Bergstrom at the time and worked security for the base, as well as was a sniper on the SWAT team. He had just gotten off duty, but was visiting with three others who were still on duty when a call came in from a general's wife that she could hear what sounded like a screaming baby down at the base dump site. The witness stated that he only accompanied the three others on the call in order to discuss an upcoming SWAT team training exercise. He describes the three men he accompanied as all fearless and rational men, all armed with their standard issue 38 caliber handguns that night. One of them was a SWAT team leader and another was a canine handler with his sentry dog. He said the sentry dog was a holdover from Vietnam and described him as especially dangerous and difficult to handle. They arrived at the dump site, which contained two rows of dumpsters, including very large trailer-sized dumpsters on the right and a row of smaller, more commercial-sized dumpsters on the left. They began making their way down the center aisle between them with the canine unit leading the way. As they walked, they heard a sound that did sound like a baby squealing coming from behind the row of smaller bins. The strange cry would repeat itself as they moved down between the dumpsters, but seemingly moving away from them and staying ahead of them as they pushed forward. At this point, they were suspecting it was nothing more than a rabbit and continued on through their walkthrough so they could wrap it up and get back. The witness says the mood changed, though. As the squealing sound continued to be repeated and had somehow doubled back and was behind them. The men walked along the row of dumpsters following the sound when suddenly they heard a very loud and heavy impact against one of the dumpsters. Something like a very large and heavy body striking the backside of one. The men, now believing it was a person, were on high alert. The canine handler would order whoever was hiding to come out or else, to no response. He repeated the order, long leashing the dog, who was tugging at his leash and barking furiously, wanting to get at the target. The handler would give one final order, and when there was still no response, he released the dog, giving the attack command. The dog bounded forward, and just as it reached the corner of the dumpster, the witnesses watched as a huge creature stood up, took two steps toward a four-foot-high barbed wire fence about ten feet away, effortlessly stepped over it without seeming to jump, and then moved quickly across a freshly plowed field just on the opposite side until it disappeared into a wood line on the far side. At the moment that the creature stood up and the dog saw him, the dog was moving so fast that his momentum caused him to continue to slide forward even as he was trying to backpedal and immediately get away from the creature. He says as soon as the dog could gain traction, this aggressive, dangerous canine ran past them, screaming, with tail tucked between his legs and urinating all over, just trying to get 
away and back to his kennel and the truck. He said he had never seen any dog, let alone this dog, act so completely terrified and would have questioned what he had actually seen if not for the dog reacting in the way that it did. The creature in question was described as huge, standing seven to eight feet tall, covered in long, dark, brownish black and matted fur. It moved fluidly as it stepped to and over the fence and then sprinted across the field. He said no person could have run as fast as what he saw that night. Because this was an official call, the men had to make an official report of their patrol, fearing it would be detrimental to their career if they reported what they actually saw. They agreed to simply report it had just been a rabbit. What an incredible encounter, though, right? <laughs> Scary AF, but really, really compelling. Just great details. If you want to see the full witness statement and the investigator write-up, uh, that one can be found in the North American Wood Ape Conservancy database. Check it out. Even the Marines aren't free of Bigfoot on their bases, especially Quantico Marine Corps Base in Virginia. The earliest account takes place in 1957, 10 years before the Patterson-Gimlin film was shot, so long before mass pop culture really took it and ran with it. This is Report 679 from the BFRO database, and it's super short, so I will just quote it directly. While I was a Marine stationed at one of the school's demonstration camps in Quantico, Virginia, I observed something that looked like a bear while walking my post. What alerted me was a dog that used to walk post with whoever was on duty at night. When she started to bark, I looked up and saw a figure that was about seven feet tall, had light brownish hair on its body, was not able to see the face due to the darkness of the wooded area, but when I told the dog to go after it, the figure just stayed there and didn't move. But when I put a round in the chamber of my M1, it took off running. I never saw it after that. I asked some Marines that came from that area if there was an animal that looked like my description, and their remark was, what did you have to drink? I really never paid any attention to the matter until years later I started to see stories of Bigfoot. I am hoping that my story can confirm someone else's sighting in that area. And I think we'll see that it ends up doing so. By the 1970s, there were so many sightings on the base that newspapers took interest enough to write about it. On February 6th, 1977, the Sunday Times in Maryland published a story titled, Marines May Have Bigfoot of Their Own, and began by stating, on-duty Marines were hearing strange sounds at night, and that a creature they had come to dub the ASA monster was called so due to frequenting their ammunition storage area. The article goes thus, a few Marines claim to have seen brown things walking on two legs. Others say they have heard strange shrieking screams, and some claim they've heard something climbing a fence. I remember the night I saw it very well, said a Marine who asked that his name not be used. It was about 2 a.m. I was walking my post when I heard something in the woods. I stopped and looked in the direction of the noise. I could see a dark figure beyond the fence just in front of the tree line, so I shined my flashlight at it. I couldn't believe what I saw. It was some kind of creature that looked like a cross between an ape and a bear. The first thing I noticed was its large, glaring eyes. Then I noticed it had arms and was covered with dark brown hair. The Marine would go on to say it stood between six to eight feet tall and resembled drawings he had seen of Bigfoot. Also, in 77, the Potomac News printed a piece on the ASA monster from John Green's book, Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us. We called the ASA sergeant of the guard to determine whether there had been any more sightings or sounds in the area, but were told that all information regarding the ASA monster is considered classified. When asked why that is so, the guard answered that he was not allowed to answer that question either. He later said that the information is not really classified, but everyone at the compound has been ordered not to talk about the monster at all. 
The final Quantico-based story I will give here took place on a training mission just outside Camp Upshore near the base and occurred in 1994. It was reported to Matt Moneymaker at the BFRO and is report number 71904. Marine Brian Robertson and his team were returning to their relocation drop-off point when they heard something paralleling them through the dense, swampy thicket in the dark as they traveled. Something large, larger than them. Everyone on the squad could hear this thing, so all were aware they were being stalked by something. Brian states, as they reached a point where they would be crossing the road, they heard this thing, at one point still distant, coming in closer. The men dropped to the ground, vigilantly looking around. With night vision, Brian says he could see something very tall and large hiding behind an oak tree about a hundred yards away. Shoulders stuck out on both sides of the tree, and whatever it was appeared to be standing eight feet tall. The group quickly crossed the road, met up with other platoons, and got out of there. Upon reporting the incident later to his commanding officer, he confirmed what he already knew about the area he had been training in. In response to the incident, the officer replied, It's a restricted area. That is impossible. Was it, though? Obviously not. All right. For more military encounters with Sasquatch, if this is really floating your Bigfoot boat, Check out a 95 and 98 report at Fort Stewart in Georgia, episode 775 of Sasquatch Chronicles called Sasquatch in Afghanistan and report 22899 in the BFRO database. Takes place at Fort Rucker Army Base in Alabama. What is kind of cool about that one is that years after the soldier's encounter, a new soldier joined his unit, a former ranger sniper from Fort Lewis, Washington, hmm, who had some very interesting experiences of his own to share with the Fort Rucker witness. Hmm, that's called a quinky dink, my friends. Uh, I will include links to all of those below for your further study. But for us here today, right now, Let's get into some sightings and encounters with law enforcement officers. We are kicking this section off with one of the kind of craziest stories that I have come across. It's, it's certainly up there. Have you guys heard about the encounter of Sheriff Deputy Jess Boiler? This officer claims that he was stalked and hunted by Bigfoot. So, Jess Boiler... A prior Marine and certified police officer was hired to be a sheriff's deputy in a rural Oregon county in 1997. On a particularly beautiful day, he had gotten off work early, still daylight to spare, gorgeous out, perfect to go hike up in the Cascades, and so that is what he did. He had been hiking for about two hours in some rougher uphill terrain when he decided, I'm going to do a redirect find a route that's a bit more open. He pulls out his map and compass to get a bearing on where he is and which direction to go, holds up his compass, and is stunned to see a person staring back at him. But he realized quickly it wasn't a person, exactly. It had a humanesque shape to it, human-ish face, but definitely not a person. And this thing was staring intensely back at Jess. Jess states that as he continued to look at it, he involuntarily cocked his head, and the creature followed suit, also cocking its head. Jess instinctively reached for his gun, and that is when the creature took off like a bolt, disappeared. Jess was now kind of intrigued. What just happened? What the hell did he just see? He moved deeper into the forest in the direction he had seen it go and started looking everywhere, trying to catch another glimpse of it. When he didn't find any sign of it, he looked for tracks. He came up short trying to locate any prints as well. He would spend a little bit longer poking around, looking longer than he should have. Then he started to feel a little uneasy, realizing it was going to get dark before he could get back to his vehicle if he didn't start heading back right then. He started his route back planning to put some distance between him and whatever he had just seen. As he trekked, he suddenly heard a snap of a large tree. He describes it 
was as loud as a gunshot. He also realized it came from a direction he wasn't expecting this thing to be, meaning it had circled him without his hearing it. Continuing on, probably at a quicker clip, he heard a second snap. The thoughts going through Jess's mind as he was hearing these snaps was, this thing definitely wasn't trying to get away from him. It certainly wasn't just watching him. It was following, tracking, stalking him and was big enough it could snap him as easily as it was those trees. As Jess barreled his way through the forest, and the snapping continued, getting closer and closer as the sun began to set, he says he was scared to death. He was scared he was about to die out there. This thing was circling. The snaps were close. He was being hunted by something he could not see but could definitely see him. He reached the edge of some trees and said he was rushing down a hill when suddenly he came upon a deer that just stood calmly in his path, clearly unafraid of him. The deer looked behind him, back at the tree line, sniffed the air, and with that, suddenly took off in the opposite direction faster than he'd ever seen a deer move before. She knew what was up. At that moment, Jess said the hair on the back of his neck stood on end, and he knew it was watching him from those trees. It was that close. He knew he was near to where he had parked and began running as fast as he could as he heard the snapping trees pick up again, now incredibly close, though he still couldn't see anything. When his car finally came into view, he's still running, and he notices that the snapping has stopped. He says he remembered thinking that they had stopped because it was right behind him. Now, obviously, Jess would make his escape and live to tell the tale. He said uh, he he told only one person uh, following the experience, and that was his boss, the sheriff, who he didn't quite expect to believe him. But to his surprise, he he did, informing him that they received reports of huge, hairy, bipedal things in the area all the time. The sheriff advised him to not make a report and to tell nobody what had happened. And he wouldn't until decades later. Such a good story. Ugh. It's, it's so good, right? Check out the link below for the Boiler Bigfoot account where Jess tells his own story. I, I literally got chills listening to his retelling of it. Just freaky stuff. Now, most LEO encounters that you will come across aren't quite so dramatic and freaky as this. Most on the surface seem quite benign and or brief, but even if it is just a set of tracks that they can't explain. It cannot be overstated the impact the experience can have on these guys and just how important it is that these catalogers of evidence and professional collectors of detail are willing to share what they saw, such as this sheriff out of St. Louis, Missouri. This story comes from Sasquatch Theory. In 1998, this county sheriff was patrolling. He was out on a remote gravel road called Little Indian Creek Road. It was the wee hours of the morning, so he says it was very quiet. No one else was out there, and he was just cruising along, listening to music. Suddenly, off to the left, at the edge of his lights, he could make out something huge. Something eight foot plus in height, with blondish white fur interspersed with some dark hair. He watched as this creature stepped in front of his vehicle and quickly crossed the road, saying, I slammed on the brakes. I hesitated for a second. It was only like maybe one or two steps, and it was across the road. It never looked at me. It just looked straightforward, determined to get across the road. I could see the muscle tone, the thickness of it. I mean, it was just massive. It was huge. It was probably every bit of four foot wide. It was probably two to two and a half feet thick. I mean, this thing just had muscle tone. And then you think that, you know, you're being told all these years that Bigfoot doesn't exist. And I see this thing walk right out in front of me. And the nervousness is still in me right now. 
just seeing this thing, knowing that it exists in the woods and to be profoundly affected by it your whole life, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about this encounter. It wasn't until the creature stepped over a fence and began crossing a field that the officer directed his spotlight at it, probably still in shock. He says as soon as he hit it with the light, this thing took off quicker than anything, traversing a six to 800 foot field quickly enough that the entire encounter from start to finish, he estimates only lasted like 25 to 30 seconds. Um, This officer would be cautious, of course, about sharing his sighting when it first happened. He only shared it with one other co-worker who he says did believe him. But this encounter obviously had a severe impact on this guy's psyche, sense of reality, his, his sense of security. And you can just hear it in his voice as he's telling the story on Sasquatch Theory. Uh, When he was interviewed on that show, it had been 24 years since that night, but he still feared it to the present day. Prior to this experience, he says he used to go hunting, um, but uh, not so much following because as he puts it, how do you defend yourself against something like that? I mean, I, I... I think that's a fair question. Um, You know, going through these kinds of stories, you know what I'm craving? One of the most eye-opening books during my look at UFOs was Leslie Keen's book. So this is my special request, putting it out there in the universe. Um, I'm going to need someone to write the Sasquatch equivalent of UFOs, pilots, military, and government officials go on the record. Someone, please make this happen. Make it happen. Let's do just a couple more, and then we'll wrap it for today. From Sasquatch, the apes among us, comes another deputy sheriff encounter. This one was printed in an Associated Press report in 1972 and took place outside of Drexel, North Carolina. This deputy sheriff and a volunteer deputy were parked on the roadside and witnessed a large creature cross the road. It was huge, kind of gray, and appeared to have no head. It looked like a six-foot man with a fur coat pulled over his head. But it was not that, and it was not a bear. When they turned their lights on, the creature would turn around and walk into the woods. Green writes, that he had received a letter from a man who had gone to see the two deputies following their sighting. The letter's author explains the two men were satisfied that what they had seen was not a bear, but appeared to be a Sasquatch. However, in a follow-up report about a week and a half later, it's explained that the two were now satisfied that what they had seen was a bear with its paws held up to shield its face from car lights. Hmm... What do y'all think? I think maybe they changed their story for the sake of their ongoing career and reputations. But that's just me. Um, there, uh, there was a, a certain encounter uh, in Whitehall, New York, as I recall, where the officer shone his lights on a Sasquatch-like creature and it raised its hands, not paws, because it wasn't a bear, um, to shield its eyes before it ran away screaming. A far more recent account took place on a cold October day in 2014 on Lulu Pass, located in the Cascades of Washington State. A crime scene investigator was out for a hike, intending to find and photograph wildlife tracks in a remote area. Along with being an investigator, he was an extensively experienced outdoorsman and very familiar with the wildlife all through the Cascade Mountains, having been all across them many times, and thus was incredibly familiar with their sounds, smells, and of course, their tracks. He parked on a service road off of the highway and set out around 7 a.m., crossing over a dirt berm blocking the service road, at which point he noticed a slightly off-putting odor in the berm area, in addition to the regular forest scents, 
but it doesn't sound like it was anything he was immediately alarmed about. He continued down the road, walking about a thousand feet before he diverted into the woods and down a ravine to follow a set of deer tracks. The area was remote. Hunting season had begun, but the witness reported there were no vehicles, hunters, or campers in the area, and he had heard no gunshots fired. He made it down the ravine about 200 feet when he noticed his camera battery was running low and began his ascent back up the ravine, realizing he had left additional batteries back in his vehicle. As he began his climb, he says he heard two loud whacks, what sounded like wood on wood, coming from 300 feet above him. He would arrive back at his vehicle around 8.15, got what he needed, and turned to head back out when he noticed something on the berm that hadn't been there earlier, some kind of tracks and signs of slippage. At first, he was excited, thinking these might be really good deer tracks, but much closer, standing over them, he says he was set back a bit as he stared down at bare, human-like footprints. He also said, as an investigator and fugitive recovery agent, the maker of these tracks was not someone he would take down. As they were quite large, 18 inches long large, at the ball they measured 7.5 inches across, at the heel 5 inches. Also, the spacing between steps alluded to a very large track maker with a stride measuring 44 to 48 inches. And the depth of the imprints alluded to a very large track maker, which he would tell the BFRO investigator who took his report he attempted unsuccessfully to recreate by jumping next to the tracks. He did also attempt to recreate the stride length similarly unsuccessfully. The witness says after several moments, the investigator in him kicked in and he set about photographing the prints, casting the most uh, well-defined one out of five total, and searching the immediate area for more tracks, though in the firm, cold ground surrounding the berm, there were no more to be found. Um, this would be the first time that this witness had ever found anything like this, purportedly Sasquatch prints, and upon discovering them, he would conclude uh, his account by sharing that having previously faced bears and cougars, having previously been shot at, his fear tolerance was pretty high. But upon this discovery, the hair on his neck stood up. He got goosebumps. And for the first time in his life, he experienced real fear and a sudden urge to run, jump in his car, and get out of there. That is saying a lot. That is BFRO report 46809 if you would like to read uh, up on the detailed write-up. Please do. Now, we could keep going with these kinds of stories. Believe it. There is plenty to see here, despite what a more skeptical take of the phenomenon might tell us. But we will stop here for now. I just wanted to give you guys a selection. Due to Bigfoot encounters and sightings not being quite front page flashy news as a topic like UFOs and ET, uh, you do have to do a little bit of digging through the databases, but the stories are there. As we can see from today's show, members of the Army, Marines, airmen, sheriff's deputies, police officers, even criminal investigators and fugitive recovery agents have experienced this phenomenon, off-duty and on patrol. In addition to that, members of the Forest Service and uh, archaeologists working for the Forest Service, members of our government saying they have had encounters with Sasquatch, law enforcement and government agencies, just like they've done with the UFO phenomenon, publicly denounce, make jokes about, and may actively refuse or take to, to take seriously enough to investigate incidents and sightings with Bigfoot, should they occur. But some of these stories today lead me to believe this is something they are well aware is taking place. John Green, 
doubted this kind of anthropological find would be kept from the public if it did indeed exist. However, if we believe the stories being told by soldiers at Edwards Air Force Base, these uh, government entities do know it exists and are actively choosing to do no such thing. I don't do much with conspiracy theory, as my longtime listeners hopefully have gathered by now. But if that is the case, if the government already knows these creatures exist and they are actively throwing it under the bus or just denying any knowledge of it outright, the very important next question would be, why? Also, if there is no there there with Bigfoot, why bring them up at all? Why spend our tax money to intentionally uh, rub a, a joke in our face? I saw a 2007 printing of an Air Force S-E-R-E -E topographical map given to military pilots to use for survival training should they ever be shot down over enemy territory. The main S-E-R-E -E school is located in Spokane, Washington. So their guys spend their training in the wilderness of Washington and are handed these maps. It's an official government map that includes all information that their trainees would need to know for the area, including a list of known dangerous animals. Why is Sasquatch listed? Everyone will tell you, oh, that, <laughs> that was done as a joke, duh, because, you know, the military is known for their jokes. Or uh, the, the Washington Environmental Atlas in 1975, published by the Army Corps of Engineers. Just a joke, right? A cartoon, a sketch, a map of the state, including pre and post 1968 sightings and track finds, its own legend, so that you can decipher those events on the map, its own write-up and description, enough information that Sasquatch gets a whole panel of the page, a third of the page dedicated to it, alongside other animals under the important wildlife of Washington header, other animals wholly considered real by all accounts, yet only receiving their one-sixth worth of space on the page. The Atlas entry does not admit that Sasquatch is real. It admits that Sasquatch was hotly disputed and yet still included it. The Atlas cost $200,000 to put out, according to an article in the Washington Star News, and yet still chose to include it on very costly, precious page space. But I don't know. I don't know. You know, sometimes the joke is just too good to pass up. The official public stance on Bigfoot aside, from what I have learned from the stories today, this is what I know. Individual officials have encountered and witnessed something that sounds an awful lot like Bigfoot. It's an ongoing event on some bases where the soldiers are instructed to just wait and watch and do not engage. They may wait years to tell their story. Some even wait until they are safely in retirement to tell their story. But at that point, why tell their story at all if there really was nothing to it? Encounters and sightings are happening out in remote areas and country roads and officers who are witness to it are having their very reality shaken. It's making believers out of non-believers in an instant, in experiences lasting 30 seconds and less. They fear their career will suffer if they report it or they'll be laughed at and ridiculed should they just describe what they saw. And so they wait too. Or suspiciously change their story a week and a half later to something that makes even less sense. I wonder how many out there have just chosen to take it to their grave. I assume a lot more than we might imagine. Today's episode is not meant 
to downplay the experience of regular citizens in light of stories coming from government officials, but it is to highlight that that is taking place frequently. When personally, I have heard that rhetoric that they don't or rarely do. We've been, we've been gaslit, dudes. <laughs> and now we are a little more enlightened on the matter, hopefully. Today's episode is also for the someone out there who felt the same way that I did about UFOs and aliens. When you hear from sources you would traditionally consider to be reputable, that they too are seeing something that your, your, your Aunt Molly told you she saw back in the 80s or your neighbor says he wards off with a git stick. When you hear it, from someone acting in an official capacity, someone just giving you the details, who gains literally nothing by doing so. Perhaps, like Kristen in early season five, a little light bulb will suddenly flicker on in your brain. That is all I've got for you today, dudes. Join me for a final note. I am hella serious about someone putting a book together with these kinds of reports. Someone get Leslie Keene on the phone. I need to speak to her. <laughs> I really enjoyed the research on this one, uh, so much so that I recorded one more story in the vein of today's episode, another police officer encounter that just ugh, rocks. And uh, I had a little fun with it, using some creative juices and fashioning it very much in a Mr. Ballin-esque tone. Shout out to Mr. Ballin. I freaking love that guy. Uh, this creation, though, can only be found over on patreon.com forward slash paranorm girl pod. Shout out to my patrons. I freaking love you guys, too. You can support the channel, too, for as little as a dollar, dudes, and enjoy content like extra stories which is a new addition to my perks blooper reels early access no ads backstage guest chats all exclusive content i've also filled everyone in over there on my entire tombstone adventure recently i was honored to vend at the wild west paracon what a crazy trip tombstone rocks <laughs> it, it does the event rocked. I met so many incredible people, got some outstanding stories. Thank you. Thank you to the folks who took a seat at my table and shared your story with me. I am so grateful, beyond grateful. And listeners, these are stories that you will be enjoying this summer while Paranorm Girl goes on hiatus following uh, this almost year-long dive into Sasquatch. I regularly do take breaks between seasons. It's uh, it's just what I do, you know? But uh, this time around, it's gonna be a, a, a tad bit longer because you guys, the subject for season seven is a big one, huge. No, not huge, huge is gonna be wild. I will be sharing the subject for S7 with you guys here shortly before our season on Bigfoot comes to an end. That's right. I said shortly, because I am almost done here, folks. <laughs> We've got just a couple more angles of Sasquatch I want to be sure to hit, and a, a couple more very cool guests known in the field. So, you know, hold on to your hats, ensure that your safety belts are buckled as we begin our descent. Local time is whatever time it is where you are. Please follow the show on social at Paranorm Girl Pod. If you are enjoying this on YouTube, hit like, subscribe, share, comment your favorite story from today's episode or your dog's name or the color of your car. I love the interaction and so does the YouTube algorithm, allegedly. Thank you guys for tuning in today. I will catch you all back here next week. Until then, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.